Chapter 4 Sir Dinadan the Humorist It seemed to me that this quaint lie was most simply and beautifully told, but then I had heard it only once, and that makes a difference. It was pleasant to the others when it was fresh, no doubt. Sir Dinadane, the humorist, was the first to awake, and he soon roused the rest with a practical joke of a sufficiently poor quality. He tied some metal jugs to a dog's tail and turned him loose, and he tore around and around the place in a frenzy of fright, with all the other dogs bellowing after him and battering and crashing against everything that came in their way, and making altogether a chaos of confusion and the most deafening din and turmoil, at which every man and woman in the multitude laughed till the tears flowed and some fell out of their chairs and wallowed on the floor in ecstasy. It was just like so many children. Sir Dinadane was so proud of his exploit that he could not keep from telling over and over again to weariness how the immortal idea happened to occur to him and that it his way with humorists of his breed he was still laughing at it after everybody else had got through he was so set up that he concluded to make a speech of course a humorous speech i think i never heard so many old played out jokes strung together in my life he was worse than the minstrels, worse than the clown in the circus. It seemed peculiarly sad to sit here thirteen hundred years before I was born and listen again to poor, flat, worm-eaten jokes that had given me the dry grips when I was a boy thirteen hundred years afterwards. It about convinced me that there isn't any such thing as a new joke possible. Everybody laughed at these antiquities, but then they always do. I had noticed that centuries later. However, of course, the scoffer didn't laugh. I, I mean, the boy. No, he scoffed. There wasn't anything he wouldn't scoff at. He said that most of Sir Dinadane's jokes were rotten and the rest were petrified. I said petrified was good, as I believed myself that the only right way to classify the majestic ages of some of those jokes was by geologic periods but that neat idea hit the boy in a blank place for geology hadn't been invented yet however i made a note of the remark and calculated to educate the commonwealth up to it if i pulled through it is no use to throw a good thing away merely because the market isn't ripe yet. Now Sir Kay arose and began to fire up on his history mill with me for fuel. It was time for me to feel serious, and I did. Sir Kay told how he had encountered me in a far land of barbarians, who all wore the same ridiculous garb that I did, a garb that was a work of enchantment, and intended to make the wearer secure from hurt by human hands. However, he had nullified the force of the enchantment by prayer, and had killed my thirteen knights in a three hours battle and taken me prisoner, sparing my life in order that so strange a curiosity as I might be exhibited to the wonder and admiration of the king and the court. He spoke of me all the time in the blandest way as this prodigious giant and this horrible sky-towering monster and this tusked and taloned man-devouring ogre. And everybody took in all this bosh in the naivest way and never smiled or seemed to notice that there was a, any discrepancy between those watered statistics and me. He said that in trying to escape from him, I sprang into the top of a tree two hundred cubits high at a single bound. 
but he dislodged me with a stone the size of a cow, which all too brassed the most of my bones, and then swore me to appear at Arthur's court for sentence. He ended by condemning me to die at noon on the 21st, and so little concerned about it that he stopped to yawn before he named the date. I was in a dismal state by this time, indeed. I was hardly enough in my right mind to keep the run of a dispute that sprung up as to how I'd better be killed, the possibility of the killing being doubted by some because of the enchantment in my clothes. And yet it was nothing but an ordinary suit of fifteen-dollar slop shops. Still, I was sane enough to notice this detail, to wit, many of the terms used in the most matter-of-fact way by this great assemblage of the first ladies and gentlemen in the land would have made a Comanche blush. Indelicacy is too mild a term to convey the idea. However, I had read Tom Jones and Roderick Random and other books of that kind, and knew that the highest and first ladies and gentlemen in England had remained little or no cleaner in their talk and in the morals and conduct which, which such talk implies clear up to a hundred years ago. In fact, clear into our own nineteenth century, in which, in which century, broadly speaking, the earliest samples of the real lady and real gentleman discoverable in English history, or in European history, for that matter, may be said to have made their appearance. Suppose Sir Walter, instead of putting the conversations into the mouths of his characters, had allowed the characters to speak for themselves. We would have had talk from Rebecca and Ivanhoe and the soft lady Rowena, which would have embarrassed a tramp in our day. However, to the unconsciously indelicate, all things are delicate. King Arthur's people were not aware that they were indecent, and I had presence of mind not to mention it. They were so troubled with my enchanted clothes that they were mightily relieved at last when old Merlin swept the difficulty away for them with a common-sense hint. He asked them why they were so dull, why it didn't occur to them to strip me. In half a minute I was as naked as a pair of tongs, and dear, dear, to think of it, I was the only embarrassed person there. Everybody discussed me and did it as unconcernedly as if I'd been a cabbage. Queen Guinevere was as naively interested as the rest and said she'd never seen anybody with legs just like mine. It was the only compliment I got, if it was a compliment. Finally, I was carried off in one direction and my perilous clothes in another. I was shoved into a dark, narrow cell in a dungeon, with some scant remnants for dinner, and some moldy straw for a bed, and no end of rats for company. 